corresponding to the eigenvalue closest to lambda zero. That's because the denominator is small in that uh, participation factor. And in fact, each time you do the iteration, you then multiply that factor over and over. And so the, the most near unwanted eigenvalue is going to die out and this ratio you have here is a ratio by which the wanted eigenvalue is going to grow compared with the unwanted one. So actually this is the reciprocal of the way that I had explained this previously for the power method. But uh, lambda p minus lambda zero is a small quantity and is in the denominator of the coefficient for the um, vector uh, phi sub p, whereas the nearby uh, most stubborn eigenvalues have this other factor which is larger. So really this factor is the growth rate of the dominant eigenvector which we are getting which is going to be phi sub p. When I spoke with my live class earlier last week I realized I probably should have written out that series expansion divided by this denominator and then showed a small ratio such that the dominant eigenvector here grew as order one. It did not grow at all, whereas the other terms died off in the ratio of the reciprocal of this quantity to the s power, where s is the number of iterations. So maybe I'll leave that as a out of class problem for the viewers to see how that goes. So I've shown the way that this number grows uh, for the dominant vector, but I could have done the uh, inverse argument to show how the unwanted vectors died. Well, Wilkinson extends this proof to the general eigenvalue problem, and there are other researchy papers available on the method. Um, after you get your vectors, then it's no trouble to find the corresponding eigenvalue uh, or, or any set of them by Rayleigh's quotient. So that's the recommended way to finish the problem. So, so this proof shown here has depended on getting initial guesses for eigenvalues and then at the end using Rayleigh's quotient. Wilkinson is very high on the inverse iteration method for finding eigenvectors. And here's a quote that I've taken from him that inverse iteration is by far the most powerful and accurate of the methods I've used for computing eigenvectors. And remember, he's considering that a part of the total eigen solution. Um, inverse iteration with sweeping is the basis of the inverse power method. Inverse iteration is used in the Givens and modified Givens method to find eigenvectors after you have already gotten eigenvalues by a transformation method. Our first problem in the problem session is to find the second natural frequency of a mechanical oscillating system. We're going to use the inverse power method with shift. Here's the mechanical system. There are no forces on it, so it's the free vibration problem or the eigen problem. Here we have something that's a stiffness matrix times a displacement vector, then a mass matrix times an acceleration vector. We're only going to do one iteration here and uh, illustrate the inverse power method. A hint is given that the second frequency omega 2 squared is near 3.0, but not exactly 3.0. Well, let's solve the problem. First of all, a general assumption for finding natural frequencies in normal modes is to assume harmonic motion. And here we use a complex exponential for that. So we put in the harmonic time dependence and the two derivatives on the acceleration terms will cough out an omega squared term 
we'll identify that as the eigenvalue. Then we cancel the e to the i omega t and are left with this algebraic problem rather than the ordinary differential equations that we just uh, had. Then we'll do the shift and put in uh, instead of the physical eigenvalue lowercase lambda, we'll put capital lambda plus 3. We now move the inertia term that's multiplied by 3 uh, to this position on the left side of the equation. And then we move the eigenvalue to the other side by subtracting off the lambda mass times displacement as shown here. Now we need to invert this matrix here and put it on the right side and ultimately bring the shifted eigenvalue to the left side. And I'll do that in the next figure. So we simplify the matrices on the left, bringing them into this single matrix. And then we invert that numerically, which I have shown over here, bringing it to the right side. Really what you're doing is multiplying both sides of this equation by the inverse of that operator matrix. Then we bring the lambda to the left side and as repeated down here. And this is the equation to be iterated. We're going to put a starting value, a, a zero value in in this location, do this forward multiplication, and then move to the left. So the trial vector that we'll start with is this um, matrix with unity in both components. And that leads to the following expression, where here we've multiplied out the matrices on the right side. We can scale that by pulling out the largest component, which is minus 1, and leaves a unit value for the largest component in the normalized vector. Of course, that operation is a little degenerate, but it is interesting that you get a negative value for the shifted eigenvalue. When we solve for that, it's really the reciprocal, you get minus 1. The physical value at that point, however, is the shift value, um, which is here, actually, and then the um, new value that we found, the uh, actual shifted eigenvalue, lambda, is minus 1. So it adds up to 2. That gives us our frequency of the square root of 2, or 1.414 radians per second. And the vector that we found was, from up above, is this vector here. So after one inverse power iteration, we have this answer for the eigenpair. I'll leave it up to the viewer to solve the problem exactly and see how close this is to the exact answer. You can use a simple determinant approach for finding the eigenvalues. Our second problem has to do with the convergence uh, using inverse power. It's a little bit of a wordy question, and it takes this entire slide just to ask the questions. Suppose you had a physical system with 100 degrees of freedom. I've plotted the first five natural frequencies on this real number axis. So we have numbers of 10, 30, 35, 40, and 60. The questions are, to which frequency would the power method converge if used directly? To which frequency would Stadola's flexibility formulation converge? That would be the, if you had k inverse, we're presuming you would um, iterate k inverse times mass. To which frequency would the inverse power method converge? If you shifted the origin to 45 hertz, which lays here, to which frequency would the inverse power converge? If you did that and then swept the trial vector free of the converged eigenvector that had previously been found, to which frequency would you converge? That would be like the second um, converged vector, or the, the most stubborn one 
in not um, quitting on the first iteration. Now let's give a solution to this long-winded problem. The power iteration that we discussed um, was only defined for the special eigenvalue problem, so it's a little hard to interpret my question on this problem. Let's assume that the mass matrix is the identity matrix so that K phi uh, equals omega squared phi would be the problem at hand. And in that case, the power iteration on the K matrix gives the largest eigenvalue, which would lie off the chart to the right. Now the Stadola flexibility formulation was of the form uh, that the phi matrix equaled omega squared and then the K inverse, which was in fact measured directly as a flexibility times mass times phi. And when working with that problem, we found that uh, the solution converges to the largest eigenvalue of K inverse times mass, which is the smallest eigenvalue in the problem, or in other words, the frequency equals 10 hertz here. Inverse power, uh, when solved for the general eigenvalue problem, would also solve to the smallest physical eigenvalue here. Uh, it would be the closest one to the origin as reference. On the other hand, in part C, where we shift to 45 hertz, then the nearest eigenvalue found by the inverse power method would be here at 40. So that would be our first eigenvalue, eigenvector pair. Then if we stay there with our shift point and sweep out the phi 4 content from the trial vectors, we'll converge to the next closest eigenvalue, which would be this one here at 35 hertz. Our third problem will make us think a little bit about the error in the iteration process and how these vectors converge. I'm proposing that there is a 100 degree of freedom system and that our engineer knows the exact value for the first frequency is at 120 hertz. If you used inverse power directly on this problem without shifting, you would get the following sequence of frequencies as estimations found by the eigenvector normalization. And that would be the numbers 132, 124, 121.3. And I've asked this uh, rather cryptic question to try to find an estimate to the second eigenfrequency, F2. So what I'm trying to get you to think about is that as I carry out the iteration and get these successive numbers, and you know that there's a most stubborn unwanted vector contained in there, can we infer what that frequency is corresponding to that most stubborn unwanted vector? And so that's how we're going to carry out our solution, is to look at the eigenvector error and see if we can infer that. Let me write out the error in the eigenvector for this inverse power method. This is a special case because there's no shift. And so in the earlier proof, there was a uh, lambda zero that's set equal to zero in this case. I'm going to factor out the denominator on the first participation coefficient, which was uh, lambda one, bring that outside a um, brace here, a square brace that extends over the whole solution. That puts lambda 1 then in the numerator of the succeeding participation coefficient terms. Each time you iterate, you raise that power uh, to one more index number. I'm using n for a general index right now. That means that the most stubborn error term will be this one. And as you reach convergence, the others hopefully will be smaller, so we'll, for the moment, neglect these. If so, 
this ratio, lambda 1 to lambda 2, is the number that we're after. If you notice that the ratio of errors that we had uh, turned out to be 12 parts on the first iteration, 4 parts on the second, and 1.3 on the third. That means that we're decreasing the error by a factor of 3 after each iteration. So this would make it appear that this ratio of lambda 1 to lambda 2 is 1 third. If that's the case, then lambda 2 must be around 360 hertz. Now, if there are other stubborn modes that we're trying to drive out that are near 360, then you may have gotten a, a pair of error terms adding up to give such a set of terms here. And so, for, for, for instance, you might get that same kind of error if you had um, uh, the next frequency, say, at 400 and, and 500 hertz. But at least 360 hertz is a, a good estimate, and that's what would happen if there were only a single stubborn um, frequency that you were trying to drive out. So 360 is our suggested answer. My fourth problem in the problem set is just another rather routine problem. So we'll just, we'll just take care of this one for bulk in our diet. Uh, here's an eigenvalue problem. Uh, it has real symmetric positive definite matrices. Uh, it was uh, looking at it originally a special eigenvalue problem. Estimate the lowest eigenvalue and corresponding eigenvector by two iterations of inverse power and uh, then give the best estimate available for the eigenvalue, uh, considering that you're only going to do two iterations, and then start with this trial vector. Now you can tell that this came from one of my exams in my course at the university. So we'll just turn the crank on this problem. Here is the general form of the eigenvalue problem, although our mass was the identity matrix. The inverse power requires this form where we invert the stiffness. So we do that literally here and then bring that to the right side. And by now I've eliminated the identity mass matrix in this expression. So we carry out the multiplication on the right-hand side to get this. We then normalize that vector by pulling out the factor of 5. And then we identify the scale factor here with the inverse of the eigenvalue. And then we have the normalized eigenvector. The eigenvalue immediately becomes 4.6. And here's our normalized eigenvector that we reinsert for our second iteration. So we multiply out the right-hand side here and then normalize it shown here. We get an approximate eigenvalue which I can find then, but I throw that away pretty much because the eigenvector, once normalized, lets us solve the Rayleigh quotient and then get our value for the eigenvalue shown below, and that's our answer. So that completes our problem and our problem set.